avenuepodcast.net. Hello, all my beautiful people. It is time for a really cool episode that I think you're going to enjoy a lot. There have been a lot of people who have requested this guy to be on. As you know, I have a lot of Oklahoma-based wrestlers on here. So I have a lot of people that um, listen and watch Oklahoma wrestling. And one of the most requested guests that I've had on the show is Dexter Hardaway. He is a recently retired wrestler and great guy. I enjoyed talking to him so much. We actually talked a lot about baseball in this episode, so that was kind of cool. We also talked about his career in wrestling, as well as him being inducted into the WFC Hall of Fame. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this, and for those of you who actually requested this, here it is. I hope that you guys get as much enjoyment out of it as I did. And for those of you who are here just to listen to the Dexter Hardaway episode, welcome. I hope that you enjoy what you hear, and I hope that you stick around and listen to some of the other great episodes I have here as well. So, if you guys are as excited as I am, then let's get this show on the road. If you give a dad a podcast. Hey dad. So where did you actually train at? I made a really good career out of being able to bump, sell, and I had a punch me face. I wasn't about to call you dad, so... (laughs) Seriously? I felt like I was in an anime or something. People get really mad at those videos for some reason. Like, it triggers certain people. Yeah. Wow. I was actually lost as an independent. And I was taken in by a traveling group of independent wrestlers. (laughs) I love it. I'm excited for this one. Bro. You get punched in the face on the daily... Do you always do these interviews with your shirt off? (laughs) What? Man, this guy won't shut up. All right, folks. So I am really excited about this guy that I've got on here today. Um, His name is uh, Dexter Hardaway. He is Mr. Entertainment. He was a wrestler out of the Oklahoma area. He retired back in 2021, I believe it was. And he has wrestled all over the place, including WFC, uh, Texoma, UWO, and even NWA. And I'm really excited to talk to him. I've actually had quite a few people request him to come on the show. So, Dexter, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing fantastic. It's funny that you say you've had quite a few people request. I mean, you know, good good thing this like it isn't um, uh, something that other people can attend. Because perhaps those people that requested me wanted to throw things in my direction. And, you know, so I'm definitely glad we're doing it over the telephone here and not, you know, some live, live podcast somewhere. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to join you. Yeah, it's uh, I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while and everything. I, I had some people either. I've had wrestlers that I brought on here who have been like, have you talked to Dexter yet? And I've been like, no, I haven't been able to get him on yet. And then I had, uh, I think, probably three people send me a message on uh, Facebook and ask me to get you on. So, it, you know, it's, this. I loved it. You know, maybe maybe those folks have heard me do these in the past. And I, you know, I, I it, again, it's up to each person that does the podcast to promote it on their end. You right. know, uh, so I can have something to promote the, for, for the people that will listen. And I love doing them, man. I, I've done like, you know, probably a dozen of them, you know, over the last like five, six years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say each one of them have been unique in, in, in its own in own right um, and not very repetitive at all. So that's pretty good, too, when you when you start making the rounds and doing podcasts. Because t- sometimes you tend, tend to get the same questions over and over again. So. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's kind of like, uh, you know, whenever, um, so Stone Cold came out with his podcast and Jericho came out with their podcast right around the same time. And they had each other on each other's shows. But it almost felt like I was listening to the same episode um, either way I was listening because they were telling the exact same stories. So it's good to be able to kind of break it up into you know, maybe talk about this one on this podcast over here and talk about this story over here. You know, it uh, makes yeah. for a lot more entertainment value. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it, each and every one of the uh, podcasts that I've done um, have absolutely been unique in, in of their own, you know, from talking not only wrestling, it, it could be any sports or, 
you know, I'm a baseball guy. So I, any, anybody, anytime anybody wants to bring up baseball, I'm all about talking that. Um, you know, so it, it's fun right now down here in Dallas, it's hockey season. So, you know, everybody, it's, it's the hockey craze. And, and honestly, if the Dallas stars don't win here in a little bit, <laughs> um, my girlfriend may break down the bedroom door here and you know, set fire. To the room. Should be, be prepared to hear that. So, <laughs> the game well, at least we know in advance what's going on. We won't just be in the dark yeah, here. <laughs> you have been warned. <laughs> So from what I read, you actually uh, wrestled from about 1996 to about 2021. So you've had quite a, a, a long career when it comes to wrestling. I, If I remember without looking at my calendar, I retired with 2,079 matches under my belt. Oh, wow. And again, that spanned uh, from 1996 to about 2011. Um, when I suffered an injury, uh, mm-hmm. a shoulder injury, and I took about seven or eight years off um, from physically doing anything that had to do with wrestling. And during that time off, um, I did. Um, I worked in the office for a few wrestling companies, mm-hmm. uh, traditional championship wrestling. Um, I helped uh, during the infancy years of wrestling for cause. Mm-hmm. Um as that um, has blossomed into what it is now, I helped. Um, I was a little part of, of the growing process with that company. Um, and then in 2018, I decided to uh, to step back in the ring again for some crazy odd reason. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had fun. I uh, there's a few things that I wanted to do. I did that during uh, during the time uh, that I was allotted or that I had allotted myself to do it again. Um, and, you know, I had done all that stuff, you know, for about four years, you know, being off that long, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's like riding a bike as they say, coming back. But, you know, when you actually get back into the swing of things, it, it can become more difficult, obviously the older you get. Right. And I'm no spring. You know, I was I was 38 when I started wrestling again the second time, um, and I was uh, 41 when I retired. So I got my licks in, I got my bumps in. I I as I tell everyone, I got it out of my system, um, <laughs> and I had fun, and I had fun, and I probably enjoyed it more um, yeah. the second time around for for those four years than I ever did before. Because you know, sometimes everybody takes it just so damn seriously. Right. You know, you never stop smell the roses and enjoy what you're actually doing. So that time around this time, I really did get to enjoy every, everything that I did. Right. You, you know, I, I'm actually hearing that a lot from different ones who have taken time off and coming back and they're really just, it, it's almost like it gives you that perspective to just enjoy it. You know, don't, uh, don't, you're not chasing things like you were before. Just enjoy the time that you have. Yes, absolutely. And even now, um, I, you know, I don't watch much wrestling on television. It, it really, it's, it's got to be one of the big four pay-per-views mm-hmm. or something that's really going to capture my attention for me and get for me to watch. Cause you know, right. I, there's other things. Um, yeah. and, and, but I do enjoy going to wrestling events and being a fan again. Yes. Um, I, I enjoy I go to a lot of indie uh, events down here, um, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And sometimes I'll travel two or three hours uh, for work. And if there's a wrestling event near where I'm working at, mm-hmm. um, you know, I like to go see that stuff too. I like to see some of my friends that I, that I still keep in contact with. I like to uh, see them when they're in town. So I still enjoy, uh, you know, going to a, a, a good wrestling event, but I would rather do that than, you know, sit at home and watch it you know, right. on television. Yeah, I, no, I get that. Um, and in Texas, Man, there is a slew of wrestling to go to there. I I only know of a few, but I know that there is a ton there. So you never run out of different shows to go to. No, yeah, you you you've got something going on just about every fr- you know. I'll say Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm-hmm. And it used to be like that when I broke in. It was you know the the tail end of of what they would say were the territory days, the uh, early 90s, mid 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I came along in 1996, um, I, you know, I got to travel quite a bit. And one of the first places that I came to is down here in Dallas, Texas for NWA Southwest. Okay. Um, a promoter by Ben Taylor back then, um, both several of us Oklahoma wrestlers. And lucky me, I got to be one of the ones that went down there. And that was probably the worst thing that could have happened for my young ego because I was like, holy crap. <laughs> you know, I get to be down here around some of these older Texas wrestlers that I remember watching, you know, from either from Mid-South episodes um, that would air or seeing them on like ESPN Classic, um, yeah. you know, and I love that. Stuff. So I thought that was the like coolest thing. And, you know, th that was about a year and a half, two years in um, to me being a professional wrestler. And. And I decided I wanted to travel. I decided right then and there that, you know, I don't want to be the guy that like stays right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to wrestle in Tulsa. I want to wrestle in Dallas. I want to wrestle in New Mexico. I want to wrestle in Canada. You know, I had all these things running in my young mind and, you know, I tried my best to accomplish what I could within the realm of what I had to work with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. It, out. <laughs> it seems to have. Yeah. So what all states did you actually wrestle in then? Uh, it probably would be easier for me to tell you, um, you know, via wrestling, I've got to like visit a lot of places. Um, yeah. And and there, most of the places that I've not been to would be uh, like New England states, gotcha. you know, New Hampshire, or, you know, places like that at Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, I've traveled just about all over the country for wrestling, either to go to a wrestling gig or to <laughs> drive across country for a monster truck slash wrestling um, event. Um, you know, those are always <laughs> fun. <Yeah. laughs> you know, when you're able to do 10, 15,000 seat arenas and have a wrestling ring in the middle of a monster truck pit um, <laughs> and professional wrestling matches take place, you know, as a break from the guys driving the monster trucks, uh, wow. you know, and, and, you know, stuff like that was pretty wild. So uh, it, states that I've wrestled in um, or that I have not wrestled in that I, that I would have loved to have done would have been maybe like Florida or um, maybe Washington or Oregon. Mm -hmm. that, that would have been nice. Um, I've traveled through uh, just about every state, you know, in the country, um, but wrestled for those are probably the, the t at the top of the list. Uh, I would have liked to have wrestled for some companies in Florida and probably up in the, uh, the uh, Northwest. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've actually started uh, following a few guys out of uh, the Northwest area up there and everything. And uh, some of them, they've got some pretty interesting guys that are coming out. Um, there was one that I found and uh, his, his name is princess death wish. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he, he's an interesting one that I actually found on TikTok that I've been and I've just been kind of following him. Um, you find all kinds of people, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and it's much easier now um, to be a pro wrestler these days than it was, you know, and I'm about to show my age here. But we used to have to perhaps type up a letterhead you uh -huh. know, um, and a welcome to someone. Um, as well as prepare a VHS tape with highlights, uh, right. you know, a highlight reel of matches. Usually it was give me a, a promo uh, that is two minutes or less, give me a wrestling match that is seven or eight minutes in time or less, mm -hmm. and you know, give me basically a list, a resume of your qualifications. And, um, you know, now it's much easier. You can type something up to someone and copy and paste it. Uh, right. You know, or or it's just much easier to communicate and network, really. And and that's great because, mm -hmm. you know, the easier that is, the more work it is for other guys, the easier it is for them to get out there, get their name out there and travel and, you know, maybe get lucky one day and make a living off of this. So, right. Yeah. Uh, in all aspects of entertainment, it has become a lot easier just because of the internet there's been things that are bad that have come out because of the internet but in the overall scheme of it when it comes to doing anything having a podcast you know i mean pretty much what i'm doing is a talk show that can now be heard anywhere because of the internet you know and it's it's made things a lot easier and i know uh 
even I, I have a lot of musicians that are on here and stuff and they, you know, trying to get your name out there is very hard whenever you don't have the, um, tools that we have nowadays. Yeah. You, you really have to own it. You have to be confident in yourself to right. know whatever you're putting out there to promote or whatever business or that you're promoting music, wrestling, whatever it may be, nightclubs. Um, mm-hmm. You've got to own it. You've got to own it. Like, like that's the best thing going today. And, you know, there's no excuse for, for anybody to not have um, that under their belt these days, or at least learning how to do stuff like that, so especially within the context of pro wrestling. Yeah. Just promoting yourselves, you know, could get you, you know, someone from, you know, halfway across the country could see you down here in the South and be like, okay, well, I, I want to book you um, where, you know, way back when it was just much easier to, or way back, it, it was, it was much harder to yeah. reach out and find people. You really had to uh, do some legwork and, and dig to find phone numbers or addresses of promoters and you know, so I, I and, and I learned when when I came back, man. Uh, before I decided that I was going to wrestle, it was probably like 2016 before I really had a conversation with a uh, with a certain someone and and told them, you know, I, I think I want to wrestle again. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I had always kept myself in shape, um, to the best of my abilities. Yeah. Um, and it was different. Um, I was probably in the best shape of my life, you know, around 2016, 2018 when I started wrestling again and I was watching almost the advent of, okay, you know, this is how you got to get over and promote yourself and be, you know, get your, get your name out there and get noticed. Um, So I would watch what like a lot of people would do and I would like mimic what they were doing. Um, Not necessarily, you know, again, I, I say, you know, this would be in 2016 or 17. So I'm forward thinking. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm practicing doing things. It can, it can be a promo at the gym, and then I would go home and, you know, edit it all together and, you know, add this, you know, uh, you know, uh, add this technique or, or this edit to it. And I would just play around with it. I'd come back in and I'd show my workout buddy and be like, what do you think? Um, you know, and, and then there's a lot of bad that comes along with that. Well, you know, you see just as much good you also see a lot of bad and things that people should not do or, right. you know, bad habits that people pick up. Um, so I, I think I did okay. And, and that was, that was fun. Um, getting to do all that and, and eventually transition helped me transition to when I stopped wrestling um, mm-hmm. to do things on, on the, on the inside, you know, filming or directing or, you know, live streams. That's that's a big thing that uh that I do a lot of work, uh, a lot of camera op work right now, um, and I do live streaming events for MMA and pro wrestling events. Um, okay. And it's the ever. It was the greatest transition from being a pro wrestler to to filming, you know, sports or specifically wrestling. Because I can do I can do MMA, I can do boxing, I can do wrestling. You know, okay. it's, all, it's all one and, and and it's great stuff, but. I think had I not delved so deep into, you know, what is it going to take to get a person over or get myself over or, and learn that whole process. I don't think, you know, I, I'd have probably just been some old guy coming back to wrestle again, you know, and have a grand old time, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's been totally <laughs> different. So what would you say is probably your favorite thing to do since you say you do do a lot of work behind the scenes now and stuff. What is your favorite part of that? Uh, you know, I, 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 I've, I've done everything from paying guys the money that they're owed to wrestle that night, pay the athletic commissions or collect money from the ticket takers. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I've been a booker in, in locker rooms, but, you know, without a doubt, my favorite has probably been um, doing camera op work um, over the last like two, two or three years. Once I stopped wrestling, um, I, I kind of knew when I was going to stop wrestling. So I also mm-hmm. planned ahead. And, you know, then now that's what I do for a living. Um, I, I will film uh, MMA events uh, here around the South in Louisiana and Mississippi and here in Texas. Um, I'll also do now, you know, a lot of the guys have been used to 
seeing me in the locker room wrestling. Now they're seeing me in locker rooms and looking at me going, wait a minute, you're filming us now? Oh, yeah, pal, <laughs> I'm filming you. And, I, and I'm making way better money than I ever did as a professional wrestler. <laughs> and, and that just blows my mind. I should have done it a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, at least you're at it now. And it sometimes it takes a little time to get to that get to that spot but you know i'm, I'm glad that you found something uh, a passion to do something after you stepped out of the ring and that's hard for a lot of guys to do because once they leave the ring uh, you know that was it that was right. the end all be all to be the big star for the night right. and what they don't understand um is that there's other stuff out there that you can do if you're good yeah well i, I know it gets in people's blood so much you know you, you hear people talk about it all the time you know, once they step out and stuff, it, it's in their blood and it's hard to stay away. So, I mean, even being able to um, do behind the scenes or do something that has to do with it, you found a way to keep it, you know, keep it going kind of, you know, because I mean, it wrestling is a passion. And, and, and it keeps me around, you know, friends that I enjoy talking to and cutting up and laughing with and, right. you know, sharing stories with it keeps me around them um you know again sometimes i pay attention to a little bit more of, of what they're doing um because you know i'm going to be involved in it i may be filming them again here real soon and you know i want to know what they do yeah you know i, I want to know what to expect uh um the, the the only thing that has not happened yet that i'm sure will happen before too long is someone diving on me and and i mean like you know an incoherent shot and boom the cameraman goes down yeah. it'll probably happen but uh <laughs> and, and hopefully uh someone you know the other cameraman across from me will will get the footage of me going down like a sack of bricks <laughs> catching the guy off the top rope <laughs> yeah yeah so I kind of want to get into a little backstory with you and everything like that so how did you actually get into wrestling uh, you know, it, it's funny because I'm probably going to tell this same exact story um, when I am inducted to the WFC Hall of Fame here on June 17th, on yes. Saturday, June 17th. Um, and we'll probably talk about that, you know, here in a little bit. Um, but what uh, I used to go to uh, wrestling events in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, at the time, the company was called the WWE. Mm -hmm. And I know question marks are going off around your head. WWE. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, it stood for World Wrestling Empire. Okay. <laughs> These guys used to do uh, wrestling events on 11th Street um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we, we used to go down there on Saturday nights, um, me and a friend of mine from high school. And we would take signs and we'd boo and cheer and yell all that good stuff. And one night, um, a wrestler by the name of the original Renegade uh, was making his rounds, telling everybody to shut up, sit down, be quiet. He hated everyone. And he tore up my sign that I had in my hand. Well, you know, at that point, you know, I'm like, well, damn, now I don't have a sign. What am I going to do? You know, um, so the next week we came back and he did the same thing. Uh, it was not part of the script. It was not something that we had, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and planned. Yeah. Um, it was just me and my friend, two 16-year-old kids coming to watch wrestling, and the bad guy tore up our signs. Well, so that <laughs> happened two weeks in a row. By the third week, we planned ahead that week and went and bought, like, five poster boards, right? <laughs> and, and we said, screw this. He's If he's going to tear up our sign like we think he is, we're, we're going to get him because we're going to pull out another sign. And then what's he going to do now? Tear up all these signs that were just, you know, he tears up one, we got another. Um, <laughs> so we, we hauled in, I think we hauled in like f five signs that night and we had him set in the back. I took one, I had mine, you know, out, out in front. I was holding it. He reached over the, the, uh, the barricade there and ripped, grabbed my sign, ripped it up. I immediately pulled another one out uh, and he, <laughs> You know, he looked at me like I was like crazy and what the hell have I done? He took that and tore it up. And when he did, when he did, 16-year-old me pushed a grown-ass man 
who is a professional wrestler who could have probably just yanked me over that barricade and <laughs> tore the thread. So I pushed him back. And at that point, I'm, I'm big. I got my chest puffed out. I remember looking back at my buddy Mario going, yeah, did you see what I just did, dude? That was awesome. But lo and behold, this wrestler was fired up. He was mad, angry, just smoke coming out of his ears. Mm -hmm. He wrestled his match. His match probably went about three minutes. After it was over, he hopped out of the ring. He came over and yelled in our direction. He had to have security take him upstairs and back to their locker room. He was he was hot. Um, and we thought it was the greatest thing ever because as you know, we thought we got worked. Right. You know, we thought, oh my God, he let us be a part of, you know, that for a moment. That was pretty cool. Um, until um, the promoter of the event came down and told us that we made him very angry uh -huh. um, by putting his hands on him. Um, so I would say it was probably a, about a week after that. I wanted him. They didn't. They said if we put our hands on wrestlers, they, they really didn't want to allow us back because they were afraid that we were going to do it again, get excited mm. and do it again. So I, I called up there to their offices. It's probably a Wednesday or Thursday after that. And I called up there to apologize. Um, and in, in that apology was also someone who was willing to pay to train and learn to be a professional wrestler that wanted to do that. And, you know, I thought at that point that I had my end. This was my way to get some type of formal groundwork training on how to be a pro wrestler. And I was right. Um, so I think we scheduled for some, something for the next Monday that I would come up there and sign paperwork. Uh, my mom would have to uh, come up there with me, um, to sign a waiver. Um, uh, because again, I was 16. Um, right. and around that time after I had started wrestling, also the athletic commission came to fruition in the state of Oklahoma. So mm -hmm. I also ended up having to have all that paperwork signed. And so when I went back up there to, to sign all this and again and make a formal apology, um, the wrestler renegade was standing right there in front of me. And, you know, all, all these years later, we can look back and laugh at it. Mm -hmm. but I have never been more scared to death in my life of standing in a room. I thought the guy was going to, like, destroy me. <laughs> if my mom had not been there, I would have probably been thrown out the window, the second story window. So, you know, who knows? If my mom had to been there with me, I would have probably been like, you know, a flapjack on the street if this guy threw me out the window. And no, you can't be a pro wrestler. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and all these years later, he, he, he that dude, um, in my formative years, um, in the first two or three years of wrestling, he really taught me how to be a bad guy, draw emotion from people. Mm -hmm. um, the right type of emotion right um and and at the right times and so uh, you know all these years later i i he was a huge part of my the er, my early success in wrestling and learning how to be a professional wrestler mm -hmm. i know that was long-winded oh. and that was a lot of stuff but that's my story on how i became a pro wrestler um i was just a fan like uh -huh. like most of them. i was just a fan that was you know, made a mistake. <laughs> Could have been a big mistake, but you know, here we are. No, man, I love that. It, it, that's cool. You know, I mean, it's it's unique, and uh, you didn't know <laughs> whenever you did that. You know, so that's really cool. I like that a lot. And thanks for mom, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th 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 thanks to mom. Yeah. <laughs> if, if she hadn't been there, I'd have probably been thrown out the window. Like I said, but she signed all the paperwork. Um, she paid the, uh, the the amount of money needed to for me to begin training, and within the following week, you know, I was going, I was finishing um, my um, sophomore year of school, about mm -hmm. to go into be a junior, um, and I was also training to be a pro wrestler like three nights a week, sometimes sometimes four or five, sometimes every night during the week. Um, you know, me and another you know, trainee would go in there and we just work out for hours on end, you know, oh, emulate wow. stuff we saw on TV, 
um, try stuff that we hadn't learned already. As long as we were safe, we yeah. didn't hurt each other or go overboard with it. You know, they, they didn't mind. We eventually had a key to the building, so we could go up there just about any time we wanted. Yeah. Um, so really, really cool time to uh, join pro wrestling. That's cool. So who was your favorite wrestler growing up? Um, my favorite wrestler growing up um, was probably a mix between Ric Flair because he was a really good bad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, you know, he was a leader in the Four Horsemen. He was he was the king on the block. Right. Um, and as far as uh, uh, good guys go, baby faces, um, Roddy Piper, big fan <laughs> of Roddy Piper. Yeah. Um, growing up, um, he 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 was probably a big influence on promos. Okay. Um, you know. So there's a lot of guys. Um, those are two of them, man. As far as, you know, w- once I got into wrestling and started figuring out, like, more of the nuances and how things work, mm-hmm. um, that probably changed over time. Uh, one of the greatest wrestlers, like, ever to step foot in a pro wrestling ring is, without a doubt, um, the greatest wrestler on God's green earth, Harley Race. Yeah. And, and when... I got the opportunity to meet and and train at Harley Races facility um, in Missouri back in 2001. I trained there for about six months. Oh wow! And it was like some of the best, the best six months I ever experienced in wrestling. Um, for not only not only being around um, Harley, but to you know, I, I've got friendships that I made. Then, you know, from people that I knew before that had started out like I did, and then they took their next step to go up there and get trained by Harley. So, you know, a a lot of guys I knew already um, Mm -hmm. that were training beforehand. So um, that was that made it a little bit easier. But, you know, that's all fine and well when you dream of it. But when you're actually sitting across the desk, from the eight-time world heavyweight champion, now shit's real. You know, <laughs> it, it's and and I'm not. You know, I was intimidated by him. Yeah. Um. Yeah. As, as well, you should be. Um, right. But but he he is great person. Him and his wife BJ, they were awesome folks. Um, they made me feel like home during my time up there, and you know, I really enjoyed that part of it. Um, so, you know, now, now we're, now we're from 96 to where I started to like, you know, I, I've got about seven years in by the time I've met Harley race and got to do, uh, you know, some extensive training up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, fr- I had friends at that time that were going back and forth to Japan, um, that were doing that there. Um, that really wasn't my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to go over there. Number one, I didn't want to fly all the way across the pond. <laughs> um, to my destination. Now, if I could drive all the way to Japan, I'm I'm all for it. But you know, I, I am not that guy that will be, you know, in the air for you know 12, 14 hours. Um, yeah. So I I I, I learned what I learned um, from Harley. I, I went up there with goals and expectations, you know, for myself, and I walked away there, you know, achieving everything that I had uh, put on the list. So. That's one that I wish that I could have met was uh, Harley Race. Uh, I've always loved his stuff. And uh, when I was a little bitty, um, they had the old, I've told this story. And I said this last week, this is my show. So I'm going to tell the story again because it's my show and I can do it. As many times as you want. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I grew up, I had a lot of the old action figures. Um, They weren't even action figures. They were just like the rubber wrestling figurines that, you know, stood about um, eight or nine inches tall. And I had George the Animal Steel and I had Harley Race. And I think I had Junkyard Dog was one of the other ones that I had as well. But the Harley Race one was always my favorite. And um, I I loved watching him. And, you know, it was a little bit after uh, he was a little before my time. But I grew up around a lot of people that appreciated the older wrestling and stuff. And so I Harley has always been, uh, you know, a, a one that I've really enjoyed seeing his stuff because he was so technical. And he was real. Yes. He was very, you know, I, I, I consider myself lucky, you know, that I got my time with him whenever I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, I really love to 
have been there during some of those stories that you, you've heard and were in some cases were confirmed by Harley himself. Yeah. Um, about him walking into a bar, slamming quarters down the pool table and knocking everybody else's off, going on nets. <laughs> like, uh, my, my table, if you don't like it, fight yeah. me. <laughs> my, my, what are you going to do if someone walks in like that? You're either going to fight him or you're going to, okay, well, it's your game. You're yeah. next. Um, so I would have loved to have been around that uh you know, and traveling with him, uh, you know, the guy could do no wrong in the state of Missouri. Yeah. Um, he could drive a hundred miles an hour and has drive, drove a hundred miles an hour down the uh, freeway mm-hmm. um, while, while j- dumping beers, beer cans out the, uh, and he's been pulled over like that yeah. and they just let him go. They, you know, so, so to be, you know, to, to have that kind of stature with their, and, and respect from everyone. Yeah. And, it goes both ways. You know, if you gave Harley race respect, he, he absolutely gave you respect as well. He was, he was a great guy. You just didn't want to make him mad. Right. Yeah. Well, I, it was different back then too. You know, yeah. if, if somebody were to walk up to you and say, you know, uh, wrestling's fake or something like that, you were required to fight them, you know, a lot of times. So people were a lot more tough when it came to being a wrestler back in his day and time. Yes. Absolutely. Difference in toughness. Um, a couple of people would probably talk your ear off about that. The difference between the guys that were, you know, in place then, they were tough and, and they bled, slept and ate pro wrestling, you know, to what it is now. Well, guys work just as hard. Yeah. It's just, you know, the territory system isn't there. There's, there's not a lot of room except for very top tier guys on the indie or territory level with my air quotes, um, <laughs> make good money. Yes. Um, there, I have several friends that I know that do this for a living and make good money at it, but they are in that top 5% of people that are able to, mm-hmm. you know, right. Most of, most of us just did it. Um, to pay a bill every now and then and have a good time, you know, being a pro wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. So did you prefer to be a heel or a face whenever you were wrestling? It never mattered to me. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, to me, the things that mattered were, were more making moments, things that people will remember. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if that requires something for the evening that's over the top and over the top memory, a big bump or, you know, whatever, um, you know, wh- whatever the moment was, you know, in, in, in our place on the, on the card that night, um, you know, that, that's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. Making pe- once you get in the car and you start driving home, you start talking about the event or the concert of the evening, you want to be, you know, one of those couple of memories that they'll remember from there. Yeah, exactly. You know? so I tell guys that all the time. So what would you say is probably your most memorable um, moment in wrestling then? Uh, well, there's a couple of them that I really am not going to share with everyone. Uh, okay. The, the more, but, um, but as far as the... Uh, the moments that, that I can, that I, that I did, um, I, I did several, you know, and everybody does it nowadays. They do extra work for um, the WWE or AEW or Ring of Honor, you know, whatever it is, Impact, you know, mm-hmm. all of them. Right. And they get paid to do that. They get, you know, nowadays they, they get to go in there in the process and, you know, cut promos and take pictures and everything like that and see how everything looks, you know, because that's how they know, you know, if they just have guys come in and go, okay, well, you're so-and-so, you're here just in case we need a spot filled. That that serves no purpose whatsoever. Yeah. Um, So uh, now they have them do all that and go through the process and, you know, you never know when you're going to find that diamond in the rough. And for me, it was always, it was, it was a little bit easier to get on um, events back in the day because you picked up the phone and you checked in with people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that email was on the way to being a thing um, and communicating that way. 
Um, but, you know, in the very early 2000s, mid 2000s, you know, um, we called people still. We called people in their office. And um, I remember, you know, constantly for like weeks and months, you know, for two or three years at a time, keeping in contact with guys like Tommy Dreamer and Dr. Tom Pritchard, who were, you know, r responsible for the extra work that guys would get um, when WWE would come around town. Um, and the, the first time I ever got to do it, um, the nerves were worn off after that. It's like, you know, okay, you do it once, you know, you've been there, done that. You see how the process works. Right. You know, next time, you, next time you're there, you're getting paid. It's time mm -hmm. to show up and go to work, whatever, yeah. whatever it needs to be. And um, one of the things that I really took from that um, during the six times that I got to do that, um, after the first time, um, the second time we showed up, uh, which would have been the following night after the first time, um, I watched a lot of their production. Um, I did not uh, work any dark matches for them. Got mm -hmm. to enjoy Kate. Got a nice little paycheck. Yeah. Um, you know, and but I, I enjoyed uh, learning on the production side of things, how to film vignettes, different ways to film vignettes or promos. Um, you know, I... I still keep in contact with a uh, gentleman that used to work for the company. Um, I, th I think he maybe quit there in like 2010 and went on to do work for ESPN and, um, and boxing, some of their boxing events. Oh, okay. um, I, his name was Bubba. And for, for like 30 years for the WWE, this guy, you know, began in the, uh, late eighties when they began to film promos and locker room interviews and things of that nature. Um, he, he was a part of that. So he worked for the company, you know, again, for almost 30 years. And, and I got to learn from him. I got to put on a headset and, and hear, uh, Kevin Dunn call the cues to the cameras. Um, you know, uh, you would hear Vince McMahon, you know, if he had something he wanted the announcers say, you would hear the instructions coming through that. He's called mm -hmm. Crazy Channel. <laughs> and Crazy Channel just simply means that you're hearing everything production-wise that's going on that evening in real time. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. Um, probably learned more doing any of that during my time there than I would have ever learned you know, wrestling moves. I enjoyed that part. I enjoyed getting in the ring, stretching out and working out, and right? Watching and listening to guys like William Regal and Dane Malenko and you know whatever name drop this, name drop that. But mm -hmm. um, but the fun part for me was being backstage. Um, and here we are, all these years later. So it all makes sense. Um, but the fun part for me was being backstage and learning how they want things filmed different ways. Um, going in their truck and seeing their massive studio on wheels with, you know, all these cool little buttons and can <laughs> monitors and oh, bro, it's it's just totally over the top. It's as they say, it's stuff that dreams are made of. And if you have dreams or aspirations like that, um, like I had, that mm -hmm. went well beyond just being a wrestler in the ring. It satisfied everything that you know I thought it would be. You know when I got the when I got that opportunity. So to answer the original question, it would be you know all the opportunities that I got to be a part of the WWE and learn like how their production and stuff like that works. Learn how they write scripts, how they you know film things. And, mm -hmm. Well, not a lot of people get to experience that side of it because they're so worried about, oh shit, I'm here to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> I am that they don't think about the hundred different other jobs that everybody has going on. Right. You know, well, around. It's a big, it's a big deal. You know, I mean, the amount of people that it takes to make that show work, you know, and a lot of times people don't think about that side of it, like you said. Um, but it's funny how, you know, uh, I, I know you were kind of alluding to this a second ago, but uh, how now you're kind of in that side of things uh, in your uh, day in, in your life now. So it, it's funny that you were able to kind of see that. And now you get to probably apply that to what you do now. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. Um, and, and you know, now I'm, I'm also at that point 
Um, you know, I want to learn the director's chair. I want to learn how to, you know, call the camera shots that evening and, and make sure that the boys are hitting the right buttons to give me the right promo at the right time that I want to see for the next map that's coming up. You know, I want to learn that side of it because it's fascinating to me, right. um, be, it, be it MMA or pro wrestling or, you know, boxing or wh- whatever sport we're, we're talking about it being done. It's yeah. all the same, right. um, you know, and, and it's really, really fun. It's been a really fun transition, man. It's like being a little kid again, learning things, you know, or being a little kid and learning, learning things for the first time. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So how did you get the uh, nickname Mr. Entertainment? Uh, I gave it to myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think it was just one of those things like, uh, you know, Rob Van Dam always called himself Mr. Yeah, you know, what, what he, he had a couple of like different nicknames for himself. Yeah, like um, the whole effing show, and the whole effing show. You yeah. had, you know, I think, I think, like there are a few people around Oklahoma that were calling themselves Mister Something. So I just like, you know what? I'm entertaining. Bam, <laughs> I'm <just> entertainment. <laughs> um, I, I think the better nicknames came along later in mm-hmm. life, uh, with the exception of one. Um, I, I got immediately got the nickname hard times when I was younger, Okay. Um, because I ran a convenience store one night and this guy came out and, and begged for some money. And when he told no, um, he proceeded to like, you know, grab my arm and either try to take my wallet or try to take my money, whatever the case was. And he basically applied a wrestling hold to him, threw his ass on the ground, and <laughs> sat on him until the cops came to pick him up. Wow. And and at first the cops wanted to charge me because the guy was claiming that I like like beat him and kicked him. I didn't. <laughs> you know, I, I there were several people around that attested to that when it happened, but yeah, you know, I, I, I was about eighteen or nineteen at that time, and they're like, you know what, you're hard time. Your hard times, man. <laughs> so that, that that was my original nickname, um, and that that probably stuck. People probably give me a hard time for that, <laughs> mostly because it, especially if they knew the story. Yeah, um, well, well, I mean, it also shows don't mess with him too. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't mess with. Don't put you in an arm bar, throw you to the ground, and spit on you. <laughs> so it, it forced them. Um, so. Uh, there was a few things whenever uh, I was kind of talking to you on Facebook that you uh, brought up and everything. And I kind of wanted to talk about that too. Uh, I know you're a big baseball fan. Um, what team do you uh, follow or do you just like baseball in general, or do you have a specific team that you like? Well, the people that like to give me hell would say that, you know, uh, it, if I, if I probably got a hat for, you know, every MLB team. Okay. Uh, there is, and that's not true. And that's not true. <laughs> um, you know, it, my, one of my hobbies is, is collecting baseballs and not just any baseballs. I chase, I, I'm a, what they call a ball hawk. Okay. I will chase third out balls, um, that are thrown up after a third out takes place. You know, they'll run off the field and they'll chuck them up. Uh-huh. Um, I like, I, I, I like to be in place to try to, you know, unfortunately you have to fight like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old kids. Um, they're throwing <laughs> elbows kicking you know yelling at you pushing um but then you know we also go to batting practice i attend a lot of batting practice at at just about every game we go to um and i try to collect baseballs and catch home runs and you know or foul balls um you know so i'm all about that um you know and but as far as my favorite teams um i've always been a houston astros fan Mm -hmm. i've always been Ken Owen ryan uh, Biggio, you know, all, all those guys, all those old old heads that used to play for the Astros. I love that team when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, Detroit Tigers. Um, my father was from Detroit, from the Michigan area, the Upper Peninsula. He worked up there a lot. Um, okay. So whenever I saw him, he would always bring me something, you know, as a kid, you know, from Detroit. So um, I became a Tigers fan. The other team that I really like, and it comes from my grandfather when we grew up watching baseball. We were either watching the St. Louis Cardinals or watching the Kansas City uh, Royals. All right. And I grew up more towards the Kansas City Royals because I ended up like, you know, like George Brett. 
when I was uh-huh. younger. He, he, you know, I like him even more as I got older and knew that, you know, he just, he just wasn't somebody you wanted to mess with. He stood his ground. He's a good baseball player and he wasn't afraid to run out of the dugout and like spear you and, you know, drop an elbow if need be, whatever the case would be. <laughs> um, you know, so those are really my teams right there, the Astros and the Tigers. Okay. Um, and the, I'm an American League guy. Um, over the years, um, I became um, a bigger fan of the Boston Red Sox mm. um, and a big poppy. Um, also enjoy uh, like modern day guys like Rafael Devers, um, you know, Kike, Kike Hernandez. I really like him. He's a good player. Mm-hmm. Um, I could go on and off about like uh, you know baseball. So you definitely opened a can of worms here. I mean, we can <laughs> any any subject you want to talk to, be it analytical or you know historic or you know you know games that are going on currently right now on my television screen. You know whatever whatever direction you want to take this, where I'm all for it. <laughs> well, you know, so I. I grew up around baseball and stuff because my grandpa was a huge fan of the St. Louis Cardinals. And so that's been my team um, ever since then. But I actually was born in uh, Independence, uh, Missouri. So right outside of Kansas City. So I've always had a soft spot for the Royals myself. So I've, you know, always said that my uh, National League team was the uh, was the Cardinals and my American League was the the Royals. But um, do what? I said that's respectable. Yeah, so um, I don't know what I would do if they actually ended up in uh, the series together. You know, <laughs> you know that that would be interesting because, uh, you know, right right now it would kind of be the equivalent of what we're seeing in real time with um, with Houston and Texas right now, mm-hmm. in, in and and that is that they're just it looks like they're going to be fighting back and forth yep. all, all year long for that top spot. Yep. Um, and now that they're adding more teams to the mix and, and a couple of more teams get the opportunity to wild card chances and play in their way in, um, to, you know, to the, to the, to the league and the championship games and all that stuff, man, it's just, you know, I mean, what are they going to do eventually like, you know, open it up and like, you know, give them 16 teams, over half the teams in the league are going to get a chance to, you know, play in, you know, the postseason. So, I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know where it stops. You know, it, it's, it, there's got to be a line. And I'm all for the rules and all that stuff, too, all the new rule changes and everything that are taking place. Um, I just think that, that the leader of the MLB, their fearless leader, Rob Manfred, um, probably likes to take things a little too quickly and, you know, what we're seeing right now implemented in the MLB, I think it probably waited another year or two before a little yeah. bit more of the kinks ironed out of it. Yeah. And I think you'd see it a lot better. I think you'd see it less arguing. And, and you know, even though it clearly states that, that, you know, if you argue balls and strikes based on all this now, you're immediately going to be ejected. Well, guys <laughs> still do it. And, and it's out of habit. And it's hilarious. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, because now – during the first half of the season here, when, when they go on break for the week after the 4th of July, Major League Baseball is on pace to have like well over 100 ejections between managers and players. Really? And, but, but yeah. And, you know, <laughs> last year, last year I, you know, don't quote me on this, but it was nowhere near on pace to have like 200 ejections for the entire year. And you could get halfway there, you know, here in a week or two. So, you know, <laughs> I, I like how baseball is like transforming and becoming, you know, new age and trying to be modern and everything. But there's some roads you just can't touch. Right, right. You know? I, I actually do have a, a problem with, you know, some of the newer rules that they came out with this year and stuff, you know, like, uh, and it, it's just because it's, it's different than what I'm used to. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get over it, but, uh, you know, it's just, it does seem like it's, you know, it's adapting to be more entertaining for maybe people who didn't watch it the way I did growing up and stuff. But I don't know, at the same time, I'm like, just leave my baseball alone. Well, and, and they have to do stuff like that because, you know, baseball is one of those sports that's like boxing. The yeah. fan base dwindling 
because the, the, the core fan base is in their fifties. Right. They're boomers. As the kids say, <laughs> uh, the average major league baseball fan is 55 years old. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, wow. um, and, and that's where baseball falls behind as far as like knowing how to promote the stars that they have. Yeah. Yeah. You see, you know, commercials now with, um, you know, Shohei Otani with like New Balance. And mm-hmm. I've seen some ice cream commercials recently. But Major League Baseball is, is the, the sport that is definitely behind the curve as far as knowing how to promote the superstars that they have. Right. The guys that are, that are, you know, in the leagues of your Joe Montana's and John Elway's and, and um, Tom Brady's and, you know, any superstar that you could think of today, be it in the NBA or the NFL, um, they know how to promote their superstars. They know what they have, and they know what they would be good at. And Major League Baseball doesn't have a clue how to do that. Right. And until they figure out how to do that, they're not going to be, you know, growing that younger fan base as quickly as they would like. Right. You know, it also goes without saying that a lot of the, the ballparks are not very fan friendly. Um, either, you know, seatings, you know, too far away from the stadium. Mm-hmm. People have a hard time getting access to autographs or, yeah. you know, pictures with the players. You know, again, that's a whole nother subject, we, you know, we go on. But, you know, over the, over the next decade, Major League Baseball really has to make a consorted effort to figure out how to draw in that younger fan base because you know the the folks that are going to be fans here in you know 10 15 years of them they're going to be in the nursing home not able to purchase tickets to go see a live game you know yeah <laughs> uh you know i still we have a uh a minor league team here in uh, northwest arkansas we've got the naturals here which is yeah. uh yeah you know, I, I think it's for the royals they're a minor league team for the royals i believe now they are. They used to be for Texas, but now they. I believe yeah. you're right. They're for the world. Yeah, and uh, I, I have still yet to take my kids to a game there. Um, I, I and I, I sound. I hate saying that. <laughs> I haven't taken them to one, but you know, I mean, it's not really advertised as well as it should be. I don't think. There you go. Yeah. And the same thing for same thing. Their minor league system. Mm-hmm. The is responsible for that, just like they are their own league. Um, and, and so that they would ultimately be at fault there. I, I, I have so many friends that go to Cardinals games and I think it's beautiful. The pictures they take in that stadium. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I enjoy seeing it. That's on the bucket list to get up there here in the next year or two. When we do so, some more traveling for games, we'd like to hit up. So we'd like to go to, uh, Colorado, go to Coors Field, um, like to hit up Kansas city, uh, St. Louis, yeah. Um, we, we already saw the Astros game. I think, I think, I think the next step in the, in the big, you know, adult fanboy experience, um, for me uh-huh. is to probably go spend about a week out there in uh, sunrise, Arizona for spring training. I think that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool. So I have two, um, things I almost got to go to. So for 2020, my wife bought me tickets to go to uh, Bush Stadium. And as you know, wow. what happened in 2020, she got them for my birthday. We were going to go on the 4th of July weekend um, show that they were going to have at Bush Stadium. They were going to have fireworks, all that stuff. And then 2020 happened, <laughs> as we know. And so I didn't actually ever get to go to it. One of the biggest heartbreaks for me in baseball was that because I've always wanted to go to Bush Stadium. And uh, probably the other one for me is uh, you were talking about uh, having access to people to get autographs and stuff. It was when uh, AutoZone Park in Memphis first opened up. It was their very first game, and it was the Redbirds versus the Cardinals. And it was back when Mark McGuire, he was on the team. He wasn't playing the, um, the home run thing had already happened. And yeah. this was after that, and he was having his back issues and things. Yeah. And so he was probably on assignment there uh, with, with the team, maybe rehabbing or something. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, he actually played uh, in the game and everything, um, but I was about 10 feet away from him. I had my little autograph book and everything. And as I started getting closer, he turned around and walked away. And (laughs) it always has, you know, just messed with me that I was that close to getting Mark McGuire's autograph and I never got it. So there, there, there's been, and, and you know, th- again, this is another, another subject I could spend an hour just talking about. Um, I recently witnessed a situation where um, a bunch of these kids were lined up behind adults that were fanboys or flippers, as they call them, where they're looking to get their cards or their baseball autograph signed. Uh-huh. And, and they turn around and they're going to flip them, you know, and man, make money off them. I sit here and watch the, you know, four or five adults get all the autographs they needed, and none of these kids got a chance at an autograph. Mm. Um, so Bobby Witt Jr. Um, uh, left, and and the kid, none of the kids got an autograph. I, Jackie, this is during the Royals series down here with the Rangers this year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I got in front row when Jackie Bradley Jr. started walking that way. I plowed myself up front, and the first thing that I did was I started grabbing baseballs and I was, I was the guy that was giving them, you know, from the kids to get them signed to Jackie and yeah. hand them back with wash and repeat. And these guys were trying to stick their cards up in my face and I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, towards the end, towards the end, I took a couple of the adults that are around with me and then Jackie signed a baseball for me, but that's the way it should be. Right. It should be for kids. Number one, yep. you know what I mean? If adults can get lucky and wave their arms around and jump up and catch a baseball, then that's great. But otherwise, leave it to the kids if it's meant to be for the kids. Right. Get out of their way. Let them get their autographs in, um, you know. And, you know, if you're a nice guy like I am and you do that stuff, at the end of it, the big superstar will be more than happy to sign one for you, you know, because you made sure all those kids got taken care of. Yeah. Um, and I just I just think major league teams should mandate, you know, they're, they're out there for batting practice for about an hour and 15, 20, 30 minutes in some cases. Mm-hmm. They can at least take, um, you know, one or two guys, you know, on a rotation um, and have them stand there during BP off to the side, you know, sign an autographs for 20 to 30 minutes. Right. You know what I mean? Get, give us a superstar every now and again, but they have to come over there. Yeah. During that near 30 minute window and sign for everybody. Yeah. And that's just some little, you know, that's like getting into an early VIP show at a wrestling event. Mm-hmm. Oh crap. We can get there early before more people are in our way. And maybe we can get to our favorite wrestler and talk to him for a few minutes before, you know, a crowd would gather and, you know, have an intimate moment with them. And that's what you want as a fan, man. You want to have those intimate moments, those, those times that you're going to remember and, you know, reflect on forever yeah you know especially the kid right yeah i uh i like that idea you know uh they should do stuff like that one of my favorite uh, videos to watch is one of uh albert pujols and uh, it was a kid had a sign and it said can we uh, uh albert can we trade jerseys and he actually ran over there took his jersey off signed it and gave it to the kid you know and lo and behold the, the some of these kids have figured out that that is a thing. Yeah. And I, I've seen, I've seen the Jersey trade like many a times where, where kids are, I saw one kid offering his shoe to someone. Um, I think it was, um, um, uh, Jose Siri. He now plays for the uh, really good Tampa Bay uh, Rays. Mm-hmm. Um, I, a little kid, uh, wanted to, uh, it was the last get one of the last games of the season a couple of years ago. And one of the kids wanted, I think it was a hat or something like that. Well, the guy, to his credit, Siri took off his game jersey, took off both of his cleats, signed them for him, handed up. So, so that right there is experiences that I'm talking about. Yeah. Not every guy has to do that and give away their equipment and jersey every night. But it's not going to hurt if you do take some of your time and go up there and sign for, you know, 100 people in 30 minutes. Not going right. to hurt anything. Right. Yeah. You know. I'll get off my soapbox now as far as <laughs> you're good, man. I, I like this. You know, uh, that's the one thing about this, you know, my show is called, if you give a dad a podcast, you never know what's going to happen here. You know, I, I, I bring you on here and we, we 
you know, go off on this long thing about baseball, and I love it. You know, my, my dream here real soon is to do a podcast about cats. That, <laughs> that is a dream. That is a dream that hopefully will come true here one day soon. Maybe I could get one with uh, you and Justin Lee, and you guys could just sit there and talk about cats. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> we can do that. that is one of the things that me and my better half do is – um, there are plenty of cat cafes around uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area here where we live. Yeah. And there, there is one out west, one down south, two down south, a couple up north, and one out west. So, you know, pick which direction you want to go to to uh, <laughs> enjoy cats, and you, you, you can have a field day, man. It's fun. <laughs> That's great. I'll definitely get on here with Justin and uh, talk some memories and talk cats. Oh yeah. He, he's a lot of fun. I've had him on twice now and I'm about to have him on a third time. I told you that earlier before we started recording. And uh, the next time we're not even going to talk about wrestling. We're just talking about Batman the next time he comes on here. So he's a lot of fun to talk to. And, and you know, Justin's a good teacher. He teaches wrestling. He, yes. he teaches wrestling training. Um, you know, uh, I, he may have a dozen students or so that he works with. And, and I always tell him, um, you know, nothing that I wouldn't say to his face. Uh, he, he's a good teacher. Right. He knows the mechanics of everything. He, he knows the counter to a counter to a counter yep. of a maneuver. Yep. Um, the only thing I tell him that he, again, he knows this himself, is that, you know, sometimes he doesn't apply the things that he teaches. Um, you know, sometimes he goes over the top or takes a big bump that he shouldn't or does a dive that, you know, he's way too old to be diving. You know, if you're older than 35, yeah. you should not dive over the ropes and leave the ring to the floor. Bad things are going to happen. It's it's inevitable. Well, shoot, next but, month I'll be uh, too old to have ever done that in my whole life then. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, if mistakes <laughs> happen, when people that are too big for their britches and a little bit older than what their brain tells them they are, yeah. Uh, you know, no, instead of know your worth, know your age, you don't get, you know, if you're 35, 40, don't, don't dive out of the ring. <laughs> be safe about it. <laughs> yeah. No, one thing I've told him, and I've said this before on the show is uh, he has a lot of like YouTube, not YouTube videos, but uh, I mean, he does have those, but uh, on his Instagram, you know, he does stuff for the hunger dojo and all that. And he has these little videos and explaining these moves and he dumbs it down enough to where somebody like me can even understand it. And I've never stepped foot in the ring before, but yet he makes it to where it makes sense to me, even whenever he's explaining this stuff. And, and when you have a good teacher that, um, you know, if you have a good teacher, chances are that teacher during his time mm -hmm. learned by asking all the same questions that you might have. Yeah. So, probably heard every single question like two or three different ways yeah. and when it when it when it's like that the best thing that you can do is just you know, lay it all out there as 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 open of a book as you can be yeah. to help someone understand yeah. you know and if you know everything that they're already going to ask why not just you know explain the nuances of it as you go so hopefully that question you know, it won't have to be asked. He'll understand it. You know what I mean? It just make it just makes it easier. You know, Justin. Justin's always been a good teacher. He he was a quick learner, just like I was. He picked up on wrestling like very quickly. Yeah. You know, because they did it in the backyard. They thought they knew what they were doing before they actually got in and learned mm -hmm. how to do it. And you know, they were they were like me. You know, they they knew for the most part. You know what was going on and and how to do things and then they just fine-tuned all that and you know here we are you know and i i think too um there when i did start wrestling again i proved to a lot of people that like i could you know you know it, 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 age doesn't mean anything right uh you know several people did what i did where they had taken quite a bit of time off and then they came back to wrestle you know and they're 38 39 40 years old Mm -hmm. And it becomes more difficult at that point. But I would like to say that I inspired some people, and I hope I did, yeah. to either a you know get themselves in shape to be able to do this once again, or just to be able to say you know what 
I'm not too old to do this. I'm still in good shape. You know, let me go back out here and have some fun again. And, you know, everybody appreciates wrestling or, or baseball or whatever your sport of choice is. Everybody appreciates it for different reasons. And that's okay because we're all different. You know, we're all, exactly. none of us are going to have the same answer probably. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're kind of coming up close to a close here. And there's a few questions I still wanted to ask you before I get you off of here. Um, so what would you probably, what's one of the craziest stories that you can tell me on here that's happened to you in wrestling? Uh, I, I think one of the funniest things that I ever experienced is a promoter not paying uh, a couple of wrestlers and they ended up um, sending, you know, they, again, this was back maybe like 2005 or six. Uh-huh. So we can send pictures back and forth to each other, but they were like grainy, very, very grainy. Mm. Um, so um, I, I remember hearing the story of guys not getting paid and, and, some of my friends like took somebody a wrestling promoters top rope and threw it in the back of their truck and drove back to Oklahoma with that damn thing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you do what you got to do. If somebody doesn't pay you. I mean, I don't know how much, you know, who's going to be, you know, if you can take a top rope to a wrestling ring to a pawn shop or something and maybe get your money back. But yeah, you know, whatever it was, that was a pretty funny story stuff that I've been involved with. Um, most of my stuff, most, most of the stuff I've been involved with that, that I enjoy, the stories that I enjoy telling, didn't even happen in the ring. Okay. Um, I, I got to, uh, during my early years, I remember uh, getting to hang out with uh, Rob Van Dam and Sabu and Fonzie at a freaking Waffle House in Amarillo, Texas. Um, you know, and extracurricular activities were taking place, you know, <laughs> behind said Waffle House there. Um, well, it is Rob Van Dam, so <laughs> it is our Sabu and it is Fonzie. So yeah. you can draw conclusions you want to, and <laughs> I'll say yes, they're probably true. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so it wasn't necessarily crazy, but it was like, whoa, what what am I doing here? Yeah, you know, it, I would have pictured myself in a million years that I would have gone to being a, a fan of those guys to yeah. like being here parking lot with them you know just having a good time chilling yeah um uh and i i i I didn't ride with too many crazy people man i i I kept uh i i was i was a little bit more reserved i watched a lot of people do crazy things um Mm -hmm. uh listen to some crazy stories but probably without a doubt my harley race story is at the top of that if you can sit in the back seat with somebody Who's just driving down, chugging beers down the highway, chunking them out the window right and left. <laughs> and when you get a police officer hand on his gun, walk up to you in the car and go, Oh, Mr. Race, I didn't realize it was you. Well, you have a good night. And please don't throw any more beers out the window on your way home, sir, and get home safely. Thank you. Wow. How crazy is that? If That's that as crazy me, as it comes by ourselves no we'd have been pulled out of that car we'd have been thrown on the ground you know <laughs> all types of field sobriety because we'd have been in jail for months yeah and you know here you got the king that is able to just you know get away with things like that but he also did great things for you know his the community right um, that he lived in elvin missouri for the longest time so um Man, you know, like I said, I, I never really got into you know too much, too many crazy things, uh, too many crazy um, um, scenarios. Uh, I just didn't put myself in those situations. Um, I was always the guy that would you know have a beer or two, and I was you know I was in bed by midnight for a hotel. You know, I mean, I, I was never with the guy unless I was sitting around listening to some crazy stories. I was yeah. never that guy causing trouble. I was always the guy sitting around listening to the stories about guys causing that trouble. So <laughs> it is great. Oh yeah. So uh, there was one thing that you brought up uh, towards the beginning of the episode. And I wanted to uh, tell you congratulations on this. And that's uh, you're going to be inducted into the WFC hall of fame. Yes, sir. That is, uh, it, it's kind of a humbling experience thinking about it. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I'm not that guy that's going to 
sit there and tell everybody that my accomplishments call for me to be recognized, you know, and here. Uh, you know, I, I, I would just assume, you know, if you have a question about wrestling or or anything that you believe I can answer, yeah. ask away. Yeah. I will answer everything, every question someone has to the best of my abilities and, and help you make sense of the situation. Yeah. And for for Tim and the guys at WFC to acknowledge me like that, um, to not only put me in in their hall of fame but to be the first guy in there Mm -hmm. um that's um you know i've always been the wrestler that would want to just do things on the fly let's call it in the ring yeah no need to talk about thing that we're going to be back here let's just call it in the ring but that's one of those nights that i i've really set especially like over the last couple of weeks anytime i've been in the car traveling and i'm not driving i've been jotting down little bullet points of things that i would like to talk about Right. Um, you know, because it's important to me. I know it's important to them, but it's, you know, just equally as important to me um, just to be there and say thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, to have somebody acknowledge what I've done for them or for their company or from wrestling as a whole, that is bad ass in my opinion. And I can't thank them enough for giving me the opportunity um, to, you know, be able to thank everyone, um, tell a couple of stories and, you know, see some old friends that night that are, you know, coming to see all of this take place, see an old man get indoctrinated as a hall of fame guy. Finally, um, <laughs> you know, and, and you know what, I would love to, um, as this thing grows and more people are at it, I'd love to be able to come in if someone wanted me to, you know, end up them and, you know, give a retrospect on their story. Yeah. Um, and that's why I picked, uh, I picked CM Burnham. Um, he writes for, uh, Oaklafan.com. Right. And he's been around my career, you know, since about 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, maybe a little bit later than that. So, you know, uh, of those, you know, 25 years, he was there for like 20 of them. So I couldn't think of a better guy to, you know, you know, give a quick synopsis of, uh, of my career. Yeah. Well, and he's the historian of Oklahoma wrestling. You know, I mean, he, he, that dude knows everything when it comes to Oklahoma wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, he's a teacher. He, he, yeah. He, he, he's really good at his job, um, be it, you know, commentary or writing wrestling, you know, um, articles or, you know, just being a teacher at his high school man he, he's really good i uh, we, we over the years we have had many many long con- philosophical conversations <laughs> um I've had a wide variety of subjects and uh, i go to him a lot for, for advice you know even to this day so yeah so i got one more question for you yes, sir for anyone who is like a new talent do you have any advice for them uh you know don't take yourself so seriously Relax, you know, especially if you're young, you get all the time in the world to learn. Um, by all means, get your education. Um, mm-hmm. A little known fact about me now that we've talked about all this, I dropped out of high school um, when I started training real good. Um, oh. I, I dropped out my junior year. I, I eventually went back and got my GD. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, so I did do that. Um, looking back, I probably should have finished high school and tried to, uh, you know, get some type of college or junior college or something like that, you know, under my belt. But you know, yeah. that would be after, after living the way I did, that would be my advice to somebody else. Make sure your education's covered because if you get hurt in pro wrestling, you know, you've got to have something to fall back on. You've got to have a decent job. That's got to have insurance to help take care of that. And, um, so, you know, if you, if you are getting in it because you love it, you just want to have fun. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever forget that. Right. Um, if you're it, to take it a little bit more seriously, um, maybe you're the best looking guy in your group, in your gym, you know, whatever the case may be, and you really want to give this a go, um, you know, you, you there are many places around the country to train, but there are very few that are credible that will actually get you um, in front of the right people that 
do take it seriously and then do make a living off this business and can give you the opportunity to do so. Yeah. So just always like listen to the right people um, and, you know, be safe. Advice for just, you know, that's my go-to for just about anybody is, you know, especially if you're young, just finish your education first. Um, make sure you're on your way to getting a good trade or, or getting a good job while also having fun learning the craft to pro wrestle. Yeah. All right, man. Well, it has been awesome talking to you. I've been looking forward to this, like I said, and uh, maybe I can get you back on here and we can talk about uh, maybe some more baseball or some MMA because we didn't even get into that. Or Oh, yeah. We didn't even touch base on, you know, w- w- that part of – of my transition after wrestling, you know, and, and that's stories within itself. So I I'd, right. I'd definitely love to come back on, be it with, you know, by ourselves again or with Justin, you know, I, I'd love to come back on and uh, anytime you'll have me. And I appreciate everyone that sat here for the last almost hour and a half. And um, hopefully you got some joy and entertainment out of some of the stories that we were talking about. So thank you very much. All right, man. Well, you have a great night. All right. You too, man. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. We are on today because of you. And in order to continue the podcast and get the guests on here that require some financial compensation, we're going to need help from people like you. Right now, we're attempting to get our YouTube videos monetized through YouTube. We need 1,000 subscribers in order to do that. So I have decided that if the 1,000 subscriber We'll get a free T-shirt like this from me and come on the show as a guest on the podcast. So subscribe today and that 1,000 subscriber will be contacted by me and be given a T-shirt and come on the show. So subscribe today. If you already have, thank you. If you haven't, please do and tell your friends and subscribe today and we'll talk to you soon and enjoy the podcast. With the blessing of the city of Brantford and Brantford Apparel, Brantford Wrestling presents Drop Kicks for Devon. Brantford's biggest wrestling fan, Devin Ryan, suffered an accident in January of this year. The communities of Brantford and of pro wrestling are coming together to support Devon through this time. June 10th, at the Boys and Girls Club of Brantford, Two Edge Street, Drop Kicks for Devon promises to be one of Brantford's most exciting nights of wrestling action of all time. Stars from around the world set to appear from PEI, Bradford Montague, from Kurdistan, the Monster Carew, and as recently seen on AEW and WWE television, KC Spinelli will be in action. Then, in the main event, as Devin was Pretty Ricky Wildey's biggest supporter, Pretty Ricky will be defending his Brantford Heavyweight Championship against John Greed inside of a steel cage. All proceeds go directly to Devin's recovery. Follow Brantford Wrestling at BTFD Wrestling for all updates. Fans, you do not want to miss this night of action, and you must be in the venue to witness this spectacle. All right, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that episode with Dexter Hardaway. He was a lot of fun to talk to, and he was a great guest. He had lots of cool stories to tell, and I look forward to bringing him back on the show here in the future to talk about some of the things that we didn't even get a chance to talk about. Maybe I'll do a cat episode with him and Justin Lee. (laughs) We'll just have to wait and see. So I've got some pretty cool guests that are coming up, and if you want to make sure and know who is coming on the show next, just make sure that you follow me on all of my social media I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I am on Snapchat, and I'm on TikTok. So uh, make sure you just follow me on all of those. Just type in If You Give a Data Podcast in the search bar, and you can find me on each and every one of those. Um, Or if you want to, you can look me up on Google, and you can find all the different places that I'm at on there as well. Uh, I think I'm the first 10 to 15 results on Google, so I'm a little bit of everywhere. (laughs) If you want to send me an email, you can do so by sending it to giveadatapodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you guys. I do take requests on guests. As you see, the one that I had on today was a request by a couple people. So um, hit me up. Let me know what you guys think of the show. If you have questions for me or if there's something you'd like me to talk about, We can do that. I had somebody recently reach out and ask me to do a watch-along episode um, to Royal Rumble 1992. 
I am still kind of looking into doing that. I'm not really sure how to do that yet. As you know, I don't do video just yet. I'm working on it. The only video I really do is on TikTok, and those are really short videos, you know. So um, hopefully I can get that worked out to where I can do this. I have a friend that I've made who is um, kind of a tech guy, so maybe he can help me to get that set up to where I can do a watch along with you guys if you guys would like to watch that. So, uh, yeah, hit me up on all the socials or on email and let me know what you guys would like to see. Also, as you're watching this, if you could rate and review this episode, um, make sure that you do that. That way people can find this. And uh, the more people that rate and review the show, the more visible I am to be uh, recommended to other people who want to listen. So make sure that you do that. Go out there and rate and review it. I am starting to see more of those. And for those of who have done that, I do appreciate you. And I hope to continue to see that. Um, also, make sure that you are subscribed on whatever pro uh, platform that you're listening on. Make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you get the notification when a new episode comes out. It always comes out on Monday. So make sure you hit that bell. That way you remember on Monday morning, hey, there's a new iGadep episode I can listen to. I want to give a shout out to my podcast networks. I am on the... Avenue Podcast Network and OIW Podcast Network. They are both wonderful places to be. They have all kinds of great shows. And uh, go and look them up. You can find them in my show notes. I will have links to both of them. Um, I do have merch available. I have t-shirts. I have mugs. I have stickers. I will be having magnets here pretty soon with my logo on it. If you would like to support, if you give a data podcast, please go out and buy one of those from me. You can do so by either contacting me or contacting my wife's business of Cups and Teas by Stacia. I will have a link to all of her stuff as well. She does all kinds of cool stuff. She does stickers. She does hats. She does t-shirts. All kinds of stuff. Uh, tumblers even, and she can do custom things. So if you send me something or send her something uh, that you would like to be put on a shirt or anything or on a tumbler, she can do it. So like I said, her stuff will be in the show notes as well. So make sure that you go and look that stuff up. And lastly, I would like to give a shout out to D Cure for making my ending theme song. The guy is awesome. He makes great music. And if you like what you hear, make sure you go and follow him. I will have a link to him in my show notes as well. I love doing this show, and I love you guys. I look forward to coming out with new stuff for you every week. Hit me up. Let me know what you think. Do the reviews, all of that. I want to be able to give you guys what you want to hear. I love you guys. I hope that you have a wonderful week, and I will see you next time. Bye. What else would you even want to listen to? That little news, if you give a dad a podcast, then it would be of you to give it a spin or two. I'll go to your room. I'm in my room rounded, but I got a podcast on. He calls us beautiful people, then tells us who we have on. The best part of my day, the world blocked out in my pods. Tell my friends all about it so that they follow along. And the host is kind of nerdy, but guess what? I am as well. I don't feel so alone, and I began walking out of my shell. Heard a story, I need a connection I haven't felt. I'll be looking for the next one, tell then farewell. It's the podcast for me. Have it on, better go see. Listen closely, download and do name remotely. It's the podcast for me. Have it on better go see. And listen closely. Download and do name remotely. This podcast is part of the OIW Podcasting Network.